Hi, this is Maya, and this is my story on how I survived child sex abuse at the hands of my father. I grew up in Essex, and my childhood, I guess I saw that as just normal childhood. I was the sport little princess. I was the one who, you know, got everything that she wanted. My relationship with my mum when I was a child was very dysfunctional. Um, I craved her attention. I craved her love. Um, she was always very cold. It was maybe around, if I remember, age 10 or 11, when I realized that this normal father-daughter relationship didn't feel quite right anymore. He used to still bath with me. And I remember having a conversation with a friend and was like, oh yeah, my dad baths with me. And the response was quite, oh, okay, <laughs> that's not normal. He would want a bath when I was getting in from school. And then I'd get changed and I'd get in the bath. And he'd get in the bath with me and be like, yeah, let's share some time together. This is, you know, father-daughter time. Mum was either out of the house or it was at the evening times where she used to go out to play bingo with her friends. And at the time, you know, when you're 10, you're 11, you start to question what's normal, but you're not going to go out and speak to anybody and be like, hey, do you bath with your dad? So my father used to always say to me, you're so beautiful, you're so pretty, you could be a model and let me take some photos of you. And the camera was always in my father's hands. I used to wake up every, nearly, nearly every night on the sofa and there'd be a cartoon playing and my dad would be crouched down beside me and he would just be stroking me and touching around um, my, my navel area and stroking. And I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh, I'm so tired. And he'd be like, hush, hush, keep watching the cartoons. It was, it was naturally inbred into me that, you know, daddy loves you so, so, so much. He cannot live without you. You know, you, you just, it was just never even something that I would consider or contemplate talking about or sharing with anybody. Because also when you've had, you know, when I had the reaction from my friend that, whoa, that's not normal. Instantly, it was just like a natural shame on me as like, oh my God. And so instantly, you don't talk about this ever again. My father was so obsessed with me and was so protective. It was normal in everybody's eyes, including my family. So for him to sit outside my school when I was at school was completely okay. He was known even by my friends at school, your dad, the white van man, because he was always around. And I remember being at school and, and he'll just drive up and down, up and down. And I'd be out on lunch break and I'd be like, oh, and my friends would be like, oh, there's your dad again. And in, internally, it would eat me alive because I knew what I was going home to. He would say like on a Sunday, oh, come on, let's pop out for McDonald's. So we'd go out in the car, in the van and he'd say, oh, yeah, there's your McDonald's. And he'd touch my, my leg and he'd touch me. And I'd be like, you know, and he'd say, well, you know how much I love you. You know that if anything ever happens, like if you ever spoke to anyone or you was ever taken from me, I'd kill myself. My father was known as the, the, the crazy man, the one that's like the possessive one, but he was also known as the one that helps everybody. And he focused that more around the, the single women. Everybody loved him, but everybody would also say he's a bit strange. My father intensified around the age of 13. I wanted to go out. I wanted to be with my friends. I wanted to party. Whenever my friends would say, oh, are we going to, you know, do you want to stay over at the weekend? I was desperate to be there. So I'd go home to my dad and I'd be like, look, dad, I want to stay at so-and-so's house tonight. And he'd be like, yeah, that's fine, but we just have to have a quick bath. So when you're at that age, it's like, okay, I really, really want to go to my friend's house. I'm going to have to have this bath. I have got no other choice. So when I got to the age of 14 to 15, I was going out and I was partying and I was going off to secret clubs. And I just remember coming home and the day after I stayed at my friend's house and my dad saying to me, what did you do last night then? And I was like, oh, we just chilled. We watched a movie. We had snacks and we went to bed early. And he just gave me a really strange smirk. And he was like, OK, yeah, here's a cup of tea, like chill out. You look really, really tired. And from that cup of tea, I would just sleep. So in the evenings when I used to come home from school, um, I'd have he'd always make a cup of tea. So after I'd have my, my cup of tea, I'd black out. But ironically, even though I was having these deep sleeps, I was always extremely tired. I moved out of my home around the age of 15 to 16. Um, I was working after school 
um, in a call center, but his, his, his obsession for me never subsided. So he was always sitting outside my flat. One morning I was going, um, I'd, I'd finished school at this point, so I left school and I was working, as I said, in the call center and my car wouldn't start. And I was like, damn it, I'm, I've got to get to work. And instantly the, the first thing to do was ring my father and he was around the corner, eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and he sat literally around the corner of my flat. He used to make me feel so bad that I wasn't spending time with him anymore. And he would he would cry and he would break his heart. And it got to the point where he would call me constantly. And I had that confused loyalty to, to my dad to not hurt him, you know. So I used to go, I used to finish work and I used to go and pop around to see him. And I'd say like that was at least nearly every day. And if there was a day where I didn't go and see him, he'd be sitting outside my flat banging on the door. It was dysfunctional. We would literally argue constantly. And I'd even have my family members saying to me, why are you being so horrible to your dad after everything he has done for you? You know, why are you so spoiled? So I was 18, 19 when I actually went on a family holiday. So with my mum, with my dad, and with my auntie, and that's where I met my now husband. So we went to Egypt and I fell in love with the, the person that was working, the entertainer, uh, the animator of the hotel. And my father realized that I liked him. So I was then beaten and told I wasn't allowed out of the hotel room. I'm not leaving this hotel until I pop my number in his back pocket. Even though he'd worked out that I was, I was, you know, as I saw it at the time, falling in love. Oh, go on then, go and have a little dance with him. It's your last night anyway. So um, I slipped my phone number in his back pocket, and then the next morning we got we got on the coach to go to the to the airport. I come back oh, from Egypt to the UK, and just as I get off the uh, plane, my phone's ringing, and it's my husband, my now husband. It just progressed really quickly from there. And literally within a couple of months, I was planning my next visit to Egypt on holiday. The second I got to the uh, hotel, they had asked me for my passport um, and to prove my age because my father had phoned the hotel that we were staying in to say that I was about to be kidnapped. And we know who you've come here to see at the hotel and you won't be allowed to see him and he's not allowed to come down and he's not allowed to do his work until you leave the hotel. And I was so, so humiliated i went straight back to my hotel room and i called my father and i went absolutely ballistic if you do not stop this this obsession and this control and everything that you've ever done to me i will call the police on you so he panicked i'm 19 years of age you are not going to continue having this power over me he calmed down he ended, we ended the phone call and I tried to meet up with my now husband. He's actually from a Tunisia. I went to stay in Tunisia for a month and that's when we realized that we want to be happy ever after. We're going to spend the rest of our lives together and we're going to get married. So we went through the process. My father walked me down the aisle and we tried to create or I tried to create this, this double life as normal as possible. When I then fell pregnant, not, not long after getting married, I was quite ill with the pregnancy living in Tunisia. And so I, ha I, I decided to return back to England and my husband followed me. But unfortunately, because we've been living in Tunisia for so long, we only had one place to go. And that was back to my mom and dad's house. When I felt pregnant in Tunisia, I remember calling my father and saying, I'm pregnant. I really, really hope I have a boy. And I remember my dad replying, I really, really hope you have a girl. And I was so, so happy and over the moon when they told me I was having a little boy. So I returned back and my husband come over, you know, unfortunately, when I when I gave birth, I had a very traumatic birth that left me with right leg paralysis. So I could not walk. And so he and my father cared for my child. And my husband was getting very, very concerned about the way my father would override my husband when it came to, you know, trying to care for our child. And it didn't take very long for them to end up in an extremely loud and aggressive argument where my dad said, it's my son. And so we moved 
out of that home. But my husband is very much a, a cultural family man. He's brought up in a, a beautiful family home. His parents are amazing. So regardless of the arguments, my husband would always say, you know, the, that's still your family. That's that grandchild. You know, we still have to be involved with them. And so what would happen was I would take my child at least once, two, twice or three times a week to go and visit that grandparent. I became instinctively extremely protective of my son and would try to make sure as much as was possible that they were never left alone. However, I was a new mum. I was extremely tired. I was very, very ill. I was going through a physio. I, had, I was due another operation. And when I used to go and stay that their home, because where we eventually moved to was like an hour, nearly two hours away. Um, and I would go on a Wednesday evening and I would stay there the night. And then there was one morning where I woke up and it was really late. I was meant to go and have lunch with my best friend. And she'd be like, I had loads of missed calls on my phone. And I remember calling her and saying, I'm so sorry. I've literally just woken up. Um, and it was like about 10, 11 a.m. And then she was like, what, you slept through? She was like, brilliant. That's what you need. Like, I'm so glad that you're getting some sleep, you know. I just looked over to the side and I was like, oh, where's my baby? Um, and I just remember walking downstairs. My mom was sat downstairs with my dad and they were just, you know, doing what normal grandparents do. But something inside me felt really, really bad. Like I had this instinct that how did you sleep so well? And also, I don't want to be in this house anymore and you're never going to see my child ever again. From that moment, I fell out with my parents. My husband and I took my newborn, or well, my, my baby at the time. So we went away to Tunisia to go and visit family in Tunisia. And my mum and dad at the same time went to France. And it was during that time that I received the phone call from Essex Police. And they basically just turned around and say, you're safe now. And my instant reply was, I don't know what you're talking about. Your father's been arrested. Um, he's in prison. I instantly just turned around and said, he's going to kill himself. You, what, what have you done? Why have you destroyed my life now? You're too late for this. I'm not telling you anything. When the police were doing their investigations, they explained to me, that a family member had gone into the my family home whilst my parents were in France to water the plants and to do pick up the, the letters and the posts as you do. But the family member just had a, a, a suspicion of something, went upstairs, went into the what was known as was my dad's office, but was actually the spare bedroom, um, and touched the computer screen. And the video came up of me being sexually abused and raped. When I came back from Tunisia, I didn't believe anything. I was still like, I don't, I'm not talking about anything. I'm not telling you anything. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you've got. And the police said to me, you don't need to do anything. We have all of the evidence that we need. More than 60 hours worth of video footage of him sexually abusing me and raping me. Whilst the police were in the family home, they switched on a, a screen okay so the police officer was in the bedroom which was my bedroom as a child and growing up and where I stayed and he was then on the screen in that spare room so the police officer is saying I can see you you're on my screen and he's saying how can you see me and he's like well this is a camera this isn't a video footage and then the police officer looked up to the light bulb and the other police officer said, you're looking straight at me right now. And that's when they went up into the loft and removed all the cameras that were installed in every light bulb inside the family home. When they found the drugs, I couldn't understand what they were trying to say to me. And they were saying to me, like, your cup of teas were when he was raping you or he was drugging you. He um, he had already had a prison sentence in 1973 for rape. I got another phone call from the police to say that he had tried to get me a letter from prison. I arrived at the family home. They found a black box. They opened the black box and they removed the contents that they needed. My father had written a letter asking me to burn the black box. The information was gone. 
and we were due to go to sentencing. But in order to understand what was going on, I asked the police if I could visit them and if I could watch some of the video footage. I wanted to see a video footage where I had fought for myself or did I just lay there and allow everything to happen to me? So I watched a video of me, very, very young, coming out of school in my penny four and my checked little uh, summer dress and my stockings, my socks up to my knees. And in the video footage, it was me with my on the floor with my father above me and he was showing me his genitals and all I kept saying what they allowed me to watch was am I making you happy now daddy and I was six the second video footage that they allowed me to watch was where I was on the bed and my father had said right it's time for your bath now um, get let's get undressed and as he went to come he had the camcorder on me uh, it was a camcorder back then and all the the video footage showed was me saying yes I'm ready put the camera away and I've kicked the camera out of his hand and the camera um, has fallen so it just goes black where it's fallen and all you hear is him about to beat me. That was the last one that I watched. Um, there was others that I'm not comfortable talking about because he violated me in ways that is not is something that I'm ready to talk about. The Black Diary um, was a very detailed account, written accounts of every single time I was raped and sexually abused with every drug he used, coded with the initial E for ecstasy, C for cocaine, and whatever other drugs he had imported illegally to use for raping me. He scored me zero to 10 on each occasion. And if it was a three, which one of them was, for his satisfaction, he would rape me again. So these diaries, and there were more of them, but this was the one that I got to see, were from being a child up until he was sentenced or he was arrested. The police officer had said to me through the video footage that I watched, I don't know how you were still alive. You were very, very young. You know, with the earliest, earliest images we have is when you were three to four. And you've been through the most horrific violent, sexual violence that we've known. And you're still standing. And it was at that point where I said, and I'll be sitting in the courtroom too. I walked in hand in hand with my husband and I sat down on, on the seat and my father was brought in to the courtroom. But he was sat behind me. There was one moment where I turned around and I looked at him. I did not recognize him. He was cold, he was, he was not remorseful, and he made eye contact with me, and I do not know who he was. I took the anonymity from the judge. The story was obviously never publicized, it was never out there, and I continued my life with nobody knowing my story. In 2018, I was told that they couldn't really hold him any longer. He would have to be released, unless we could find something to, to bring him back inside. And for some reason, I decided to Google my father's name. And his name came at the top of Google for being in prison as a support listener for other wing members. So he worked for a charity as a, a reform project to help others. So now my father's name was in Google as a hero. But what people didn't know was he was a sex offender. I'm going to waive my anonymity and I'm going to show the world what this man is about because you are releasing him from prison whilst I have to suffer the life sentence. I contacted the journalist and said, I have a story for you. And from there, 
the story went went national, it went viral. And the, the, the comments and the love that came pouring in and the support that came pouring in, it took me months to accept that and not accept the shame and the stigma and the silence. And it was only when I was awarded my British Empire Medal from the Queen in 2020 that I knew I'd made a movement, I'd made a legacy. So I work in education sector now and I'm working with, you know, um, young children, young people from the ages of 12 up to 16 who have never spoken out. When you see news of sexual offenders, you very rarely see the survivor's story. And that's because of the shame and the stigma and the silencing and the grooming process. We deserve a platform, we deserve to be heard and we deserve to speak out and we deserve to heal. We are expected to be failing in education and in life. We're supposed to be on the streets, we're supposed to be homeless. So the more we can highlight and show that we can, we can be a success. Don't just put me in your little box of statistics of how I should be. Then for me, that makes the difference. And for those that are suffering or are worried about a child, know that no child will disclose necessarily verbally. You have a duty to look out for the signs of those being sexually abused. But when you're constantly hearing she's a spoiled little princess, daddy gives her everything, and you start seeing the signs that she's hypersexualized, things that are just not adding up, listen to that instinct because we are so quick to brush it under the carpet and yes it can break people and break families if it's incorrect but there's nothing more broken than a child that can't be saved thank you for listening to my story and i really hope that you've taken something from it and if you would like to continue following me and supporting my journey as i go through from surviving to thriving you can follow me on social media